Okay, this is the Algebra 2 Test 6, Part 2 Review. We're doing Part 2 before we do Part 1, because Part 2 we've done recently, so this will be better in your brain, Part 1. I want to do right before the test, because it's been a while since you've done it. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense, but this is the Part 2 of the Test 6 Review. All right, also the formatting is going to be a little wonky on here sometimes, because I had to copy it from a Word file into the notebook file. So find the inverses of the following functions. So Part A f of x equals 5x plus 8. We want to change that f of x to be y. So y equals 5x plus 8. Now to do inverses, we switch the place of the x and the y. So now x equals 5y plus 8. We subtract 8 to both sides, and we're left with x minus 8 equals 5y. We divide both sides by 5. And y equals, and you can write your answer two different ways. You can write it 1 fifth x minus 8 fifths. Or you can write it as one big fraction of x minus 8 all over 5. Either way, it's perfectly peachy, and they're the exact same answer, just written differently. Okay, letter B. Letter B says f of x equals negative 3x minus 4 fifths. So again, we're going to change that to a y. So y equals negative 3x minus 4 fifths. We are going to switch the places of our x and our y. So x equals negative 3y minus 4 fifths. We're going to add 4 fifths to both sides. So now we're left with x plus 4 fifths equals negative 3y. To get rid of that negative 3 in front of the y, we want to divide both sides by negative 3. Now this time, we are going to have to do each one separately. So y equals negative 1 third x. And here we have a little bit of a conundrum. We have a fraction inside of, oh yes, that's right, inside of another fraction. And that is evil incarnate. We cannot have a fraction inside of a fraction. So what we want to do is we want to get rid of the fraction inside of a fraction. So you need to ask yourself and say, self, what do you do when you're dividing fractions? Well, self, when you're dividing fractions, what you're doing is really multiplying by the reciprocal. So we're going to multiply the top and the bottom of this fraction by the reciprocal of negative one third. And then that's going to get us negative four fifteenths. So your answer should be negative one third x minus 4 fifteenths equals y. Okay, letter C. We have f of x equals 5x minus 3 halves. Again, change this to a y. We're going to switch the place of the x and the y. We're going to add the 3 halves to both sides. So we get x plus 3 halves equals 5y. We're going to divide both sides by half, by 5, sorry, just like we did on the middle problem. So we're going to have 1 fifth x. Again, over here we have a fraction inside of a fraction. Very, very bad. So we're going to multiply by the reciprocal again of 1 fifth. 3 times 1 is 3. 2 times 5 is 10 equals y. So you're left with the answer of 1 fifth x plus 3 tenths equals y. Okay, question number two. Verify that f and g are inverse functions by computing their compositions. Show all work. So we have f of x equals 4x plus 3, and g of x equals 1 fourth x minus 3 fourths. And we want to verify that they are inverse functions. So we need to plug one into the other. So that is why we have our composition function here, f of g of x. So this means we take our f equation and into that x we're going to plug in the g equation. And then we're going to simplify this out. We're going to distribute through that 4. 4 times 1 fourth x is just x. 4 times negative 3 fourths is negative 3. Then we have this plus 3. 
negative 3 plus 3 cancels out, leaving us with just x, which is exactly what we want to be left with in this case whenever we're verifying. So we're going to do the same thing, but in reverse. So we're going to start off with the g function, the 1 fourth x minus 3 fourths. And this time, that's a minus. We're going to plug the f equation into that. So we have 4x plus 3. We're going to distribute this out. 1 fourth times 4x gives us just x. 1 fourth times 3 is 3 fourths. And then minus 3 fourths. 3 fourths minus 3 fourths is 0. They cancel out, leaving us with just x, which is exactly what we want to be left with when we're verifying inverse functions. Okay, we have another one, exact same thing. Try it on your own first. Hit pause, come back, and see the process if we did not get x at the end of both of them. Okay, so we write our f equation. And then we're going to plug in our g equation. We're going to distribute out the negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 1 half x leaves us with x. Negative 2 times negative 3 halves gives us plus 3. And then we have our minus 3 from the end of the problem. Positive 3 minus 3 cancels out, leaving us with just x. Yay! Now we're going to do the reverse of that. We're going to be given our g equation. And we're going to plug our f equation into that. Negative 2x minus 3. We're going to distribute out. Negative 1 half times negative 2x gives us x. Negative 1 half times negative 3 is a positive 3 halves and then minus 3 halves from the end of the equation. 3 halves minus 3 halves is 0, cancels out. So we're left with just x. Yay! So they are inverses of one another. Question 4 really looks funky on here. It did not copy well from my word file. I'm sorry about that. So number 4 says, are the inverses of these functions also functions? And then in parentheses, do they pass the horizontal line test? Well, let's draw some horizontal lines. It hits our graph one point. So far, so good. Down here, it hits our graph at one point. So far, so good. Uh-oh. Here, it hits our original function three separate times. Evil. Evil incarnate. It, the inverse is not a function. This is a no. Part B. It's good so far. We're doing well. I don't see anywhere on here that it's going to hit that red line more than one time. So yes, this is a function. The inverse of this is a function. Okay, part C. It's really tiny over here. I'm sorry about that. If I hit the very top of it, it hits at one point. But right here, I hit twice. Once I find at least one horizontal line that hits the graph twice or more, then that means the inverse is not a function. And then letter D, we just have our basic line. We're drawing horizontal lines. And we're only ever going to hit that graph one time. So this inverse of this graph would be a function as well. Yay! OK, five, six, and seven on your review guide. Draw an example of a graph that is a function and whose inverse is also a function. And then explain why. The way I've been explaining this to kids today is the following. If we want to have something that is a function, that means it needs to pass the vertical line test. If we want to prove that the inverse is also a function, that needs to pass the horizontal line test. Those are what we need to pay attention to, the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. So for this one, we want to draw an example of a graph that passes the vertical 
and it passes the horizontal. So I'm going to draw a little coordinate plane here for each of these, little axes. And let's think it through. So it passes the vertical and it passes the horizontal. So that means this could be a basic line because it would pass the horizontal line test and it would pass the vertical line test. You could also have something like our square root graph. That would also work. There are multiple answers for this one. There's not just one single answer. Okay, number six, draw an example of a graph that is not a function. That means it has to fail the vertical line test. That means when we draw vertical lines, it has to hit it at more than one point. It could hit at two or three, any of those. But we want to have it pass the horizontal line test. So fail the vertical, pass the horizontal. Try and come up and see if you can come up with a graph on your own. Then I'll give you a couple different examples of ones that work for this case. Okay, one example that works is a sideways parabola. Because it will pass, or it will pass the horizontal line test, but it will most definitely fail the vertical line test. Another one would be something like a big S or a dollar sign. It fails the vertical line test, passes the horizontal line test. So both of those work in this case. Number seven, I draw an example of a graph that is a function. So that means it passes the vertical, but whose inverse is not a function. So that means it fails the horizontal. So again, there's multiple different graphs you can have for this. The one you will most likely see usually is a parabola. Because parabolas are functions, but if you do the horizontal line test, it's going to hit it more than one time. Another one would be an absolute value graph. That graph also passes the vertical line test, but fails the horizontal line test. So on this, you need to know that there are multiple answers you could have. Just because your graph does not match specifically what I have up here does not mean it is wrong. Do the vertical line test, do the horizontal line test, and see if it fits those specifications. Okay, number eight, graph the following graphs and then state the domain and ranges. So y equals root x plus three. So we're going to graph this out. We're going to do an xy chart. We're going to start off with our hanking kelly point. What is our hanking kelly point? In this case, it is 0, 3. Because remember, hank goes with the x's, kelly goes with the y's. Then we do our points from there. 1, 2, skip 1, 4. Plug in the numbers. We should get 4, 4.4, and... Five. Then we plot those on our graph, 0, 3, 1, 4, 2, 4.4, 4, and 4, 5. Our graph looks like this. We need to state our domain and our range. Again, our domain has to do with our x values. So where do our x values start? Well, that has to do with our hanking heli point. So our domain, our x is going to be greater than or equal to 0 because we're doing all these positive numbers here, getting bigger. Those are the numbers we're plugging in. Our range is going to be y is greater than or equal to 3, because our y's keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. If we had a reverse graph like this, our range would be y is less than or equal to whatever number we're starting off with. Okay, next graph, number 9. y equals the square root of x plus 2. Find our Hank and Kelly point first. Our Hank and Kelly point is negative 2 and then 0. Because remember, Hank lies, so we switch the x value. And then Kelly tells the truth. There is no Kelly in this point, in this problem, so it's a 0. Start off with negative 2, 0. And we do negative 1, 0, skip 1, and go to 2. 
Plugging in negative 1, we get out a positive 1. Plugging in 0 is 1.4. Plugging in 2, and we get out 2. Again, you can do these manually by plugging these numbers in or using the table function on your calculator. Either way is fine. We graph it, negative 2, 0. Negative 1, 1. 0, 1.4. And 2, 2. Draw our square root graph, just like that. Our domain, again, has to do with our Hankin-Kelly point. Our domain is x is greater than or equal to negative 2. Our range, y is greater than or equal to 0. Yay! Okay, next one, number 10. y equals, this time around, the cubed root of x minus 5. So we start off cube roots the same way. We need to find our Hank and Kelly point. In this case, it is 0, negative 5. But this time when we do our xy graph, our Hank and Kelly point goes in the middle of it. And we do this because it's the cube root. So we're going to plug in numbers on either side of that 0. So plugging in 1, we're going to get negative 4. Plugging in negative 1, we're going to get negative 6. Plugging in 2, we get negative 3.7. And then plugging in uh, negative 2, you should get negative 6.3. Okay, we're going to plot those. I always plot my Hank and Kelly point first. 0, negative 5. 1, negative 4. Negative 1, negative 6. And our two other points. And this is the graph. It is not a straight line. This is kind of a smushed S looking graph. So our domain, what type of X's can we plug into this problem? We can plug in everything, all reals. What numbers are we going to get out of this? Again, all reals. There you go. Question 11, now we're solving radical functions. Solve the following equations, check for extraneous solutions. So we have the cubed root of x minus 5 equals 4. Well, this is the cubed root. How do we get rid of a cubed root, you ask? Well, we have to do the opposite of it. We want to cube both sides. So we cube a cubed root. Cancels out. We're left with x minus 5 equals 4 to the third power, 64. Add 5 to both sides. So we get x equals 64 plus 5 is 69. Are we done? No. No, we are not. We need to go back and, yes, check our work. So we're going to plug in 69 to the original equation. 69 minus 5 is 64. The cubed root of 64 is 4. And does 4 equal 4? Yes. Yes, it does. So x equals 69. The cubed root of 2x plus 7 equals 5. Again, it's a cubed root, so we want to cube both sides. So we're left with 2x plus 7 equals 125. Subtract 7 to both sides. 2x equals 118. Divide both sides by 2. And x equals 59, but are we done? No, of course we're not done. We need to go back and check our work. So we have the cubed root of 2 times 59 plus 7 equals 5. 2 times 59 is 118. 118 plus 7 is 125. The cubed root of 125 is 5. Does 5 equal 5? Yes. Yes, it does. So x equals 59. Yay! Number 12. We have the quantity x minus 1 to the 2 fifths power minus 3 equals 6. So for this one, we want to isolate the fractional exponent terms. So we want to get the parentheses by itself. To do that, we're going to add 3 to both sides. Then we're going to be left with x minus 1 to the 2 fifths power 
equals 9. Now, we want to get rid of that fractional exponent. To do that, we're going to take each side to the reciprocal of that exponent. This is 2 fifths, so we're going to raise each side to the 5 halves power. On the left-hand side, you have a power to a power, so you multiply them so they cancel out, leaving us with just x minus 1. On the right-hand side, we have 9 to the 5 halves power. That means the square root of 9 is 3. And then 3 to the 5th power is 243. Add 1. And we get x equals 244 is our answer. But are we done? No. No, we are not. We need to go back and check our answer. So plugging it back into the original equation, 244 minus 1 to the 2 fifths power minus 3 equals 6. 244 minus 1 is 243. 243 to the 2 fifths power minus 3 equals 6. 243 to the 2 fifths power means the fifth root of 243, which is 3. And then 3 squared, which is, yes, that's right, 9. And what is 9 minus 3? It is 6. And does 6 equal 6? Yes. Yes, it does. So x equals 244. Next problem, we have 8 equals negative 2 times the cubed root of 2x plus 10. We're going to divide both sides by negative 2. Negative 4 equals the cubed root of 2x plus 10. How do you get rid of a cubed root? Well, you need to cube both sides then. Negative 4 cubed is negative 64. On the right-hand side, you cube a cube root, so that's gone. You're left with 2x plus 10. And solve for x. You're going to subtract 10 to both sides. Negative 74 equals 2x. Divide both sides by 2. And negative 74 divided by 2 is x equals negative 37. Are you done? By now you should know, no, you are not done. You need to check our work. So we have 8 equals negative 2 times the cube root of 2 times negative 37 plus 10. 8 equals negative 2 times the cube root of 2 times negative 37 is negative 74 plus 10. The cube root of negative 74 plus 10 is negative 64. The cube root of negative 64 is negative 4. And negative 2 times negative 4 is 8. Does 8 equal 8? Yes. Yes, it does. So x equals negative 37. And finally, the last problem for this part of the review guide. We have the square root of 2x minus 6 equals the square root of 5x minus 15. Looks a little wacky with a whole bunch of square roots running in there, but it's really not that bad. You're taking the square root of both sides, so how do you get rid of a square root? You square it. Squaring a square root, they cancel each other out, and you're left with what's underneath. 2x minus 6 equals 5x minus 15. And we just need to solve this problem. So I'm going to subtract 5x to both sides, add 6. If you did it the other way and moved the 2x and the 15, perfectly peachy. It does not matter. 2x minus 5x is negative 3x. Negative 15 plus 6 is negative 9. Divide both sides by negative 3, and x equals 3. Are you done? Not quite. Almost. We need to check it. So 2 times 3 minus 6 equals the square root of 5 times 3 minus 15. So the square root of 6 minus 6 equals the square root of 15 minus 15. 6 minus 6 is 0. 15 minus 15 is 0. And what is the square root of 0? Why, that's 0. So 0 equals 0? Yes. Yes, it does. 
So that e means x equals 3. So this is the part 2 of our review for test 6. We're going to actually be doing part 1 on Monday. Hope you all have a marvelous weekend and stay warm.